we have uh, the pleasure uh, of um, having a talk on the characteristic building problem. So uh, introductions usually include uh, or usually involve just the you know the speaker's name and the title. But since this is a subject close to my heart, and I spent uh, hours yesterday talking uh, about uh, your work on gluing, uh, I think it deserves a little bit more of a, an introduction. So uh, you might ask, you know, why is gluing interesting? Why is gluing important? The point is that there is some reference for base times that, that we have in GR, Schwarzschild, or Kerr, etc. And that uh, gluing is interesting because uh, for, you know, for a lot of work that that people want to do, you want to you want to solve uh, you want to solve the Cauchy problem. See what the space time will eventually become. And gluing is ex is is an extremely useful tool to create initial data where you have some control on part of that initial data. And it's been a popular thing to do in MathGR for years. And we're very lucky today because uh, you've written some papers with with your co-authors that really give a different perspective on gluing. So I'm very excited. Uh, for this talk, uh, and I'm sure you'll all enjoy it. So, please. Well, Nathan, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I also want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk here at the Black Hole Initiative. It's a great pleasure um, to speak in front of such an illustrious audience. Today, I will talk about the characteristic gluing problem of general relativity. Now, this is work I did in collaboration with Stefanos Aretakis at the University of Toronto and uh, Igor Rodnianski in Princeton University. And before I go into the talk, I already want to give you just a four point summary of our work. Okay, so abstract four point summary. So today what we will do is we introduce the characteristic gluing problem for the einstein machen equations. We identify an infinite dimensional space of obstructions to this characteristic gluing problem near Minkowski, the trivial solution. And we understand that these obstructions come from conservation laws for the linearized equations. Um, so conservation laws along outgoing non hubble surfaces. Third, we show that by applying gauge perturbations to the gluing data, we can reduce this infinite dimensional space of obstructions to be actually only 10 dimensional. And moreover, this 10 dimensional space of obstructions can be identified to be related exactly to the ADM integrals of energy, linear momentum, angular momentum, and center of mass. So with a geometric interpretation of this 10 dimensional space of obstructions, and it should be there, it's natural to see that. If we wouldn't see it, it would be a bit weird. Now, as a corollary, um, we give alternative proofs of some celebrated results of, uh, of um, space-like initial data, for example, the Covino chain, a space like gluing to occur and the Colotto chain localization of space like initial data. But also, I will argue that um, the formalism we develop can be used to study observational signatures for extremal and near extremal black holes in the spirit of the Aritakis instability. Okay. So, this is the, the, uh, the four point summary of our work. Now, I want to start with um, introducing the characteristic gluing problem meaning that I want to talk about what is initial data for answer equations um, and setting up characteristic initial data. Then we will talk about the, these obstructions. We will derive them together. We will see how these gauge perturbations actually allow us to understand what these conservation laws, which of these conservation laws are just gauge and which of these are really um, have a, a geometric meaning. And uh, you know we'll state the main result and then we'll have some applications. Okay? Great. Now, um, let me make the introduction and the setup of the characteristic gluing problem. Now, let me just, uh, you know, to make sure that we're all on the same page with respect to notation, everything, let me just remind you. So, today um, we're considering the answer equations. Uh, so, they are Ritchie mu mu minus one half scalar curvature. Uh, G mu mu is equal to 8 pi. Menu to be satisfied by you know the Lorentz informal default. Um, Mg, which is called the space time. Space time. 
So on the left-hand side, I, I calculate the, the rich terms of the Lorentz metric. Um, here I calculate the scalar curvature. Here's the Lorentz metric. And so the left-hand side is purely geometric. On the right-hand side, I have T mu is the energy momentum stress tensor of the, the universe that I'm considering. So for today's talk, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I want to study vacuum space times. So I'm going to set T mu nu is equal to zero, um, which is a, a vacuum case. And you can convince yourself that the left hand side is equal to zero is equivalent to just saying the rich mu nu is equal to zero. Okay. So these are the, the Einstein vacuum equations that we will consider today's talk. Now, let's talk a bit about the quality of the features of the Einstein equations. Well, um, so this tends to symmetric, so you can think of this as 10 uh, equations. And what I want to underline is that it's, um, it's uh, of hyperbolic nature, okay? Uh, so uh, Einstein equations, Einstein equations of a hyperbolic nature. What do I mean by this? They have, um, they have a well-defined initial value problem. And what I want to do in the next minutes is to talk about two different ways to specify initial data for these Einstein equations. Maybe first, I want to talk about space-like initial data, where, you know, um, coming from the Newtonian point of view, that you specify initial data on a on the surface of constant time and you develop forward. Okay, so space like uh, initial value problem. And the second one is the characteristic initial value problem where you specify initial data on characteristic hypersurfaces and you solve towards the future. But I will go through that in detail. Great, so let's talk about uh, this, this space like initial data. I want to consider um, a, a hypersurface sigma. So this I, I think of as a constant time surface. And on it, you know, coming from the Newtonian point of view, I, you know, you could say, okay, this is a second order equation. So what you want to specify on sigma is the, the value of the metric and its first time derivative. So let's, you know, let's say here's a, the time like vector field. I want to specify, um, the induced metric G on it, and also it's T derivative in a sense. And you know, differential geometry essentially tells you that this uh, T derivative is the extrinsic curvature, the second fundamental form of this surface. So a natural you know, approach to, to set up initial, value, initial values for the answer equations is by prescribing the induced metric and the second fundamental form of such a hypersurface. That's a, uh, that's, uh, the three plus one approach to, to the answer equations. And it turns out that you cannot just prescribe any G and any K on the surface and expect to be able to solve because the, the geometry, of, so, so the fact that you need to solve the answer equations um, stipulates that on this sigma here, there must be relations between G and K. In other words, the initial data must satisfy uh, compatibility conditions. For example, when you when you try to solve Maxwell's equation, you also have on the initial data, you know, the, the divergence of uh, B must be equal to zero. So the constraint equation. Uh, for Einstein equations, there are similar constraints. And uh, let me write them out. So there the scalar curvature of G to be equal to K squared minus the trace of K squared. And it's the Gauss, the Gauss equation. And um, the divergence of K should be the exterior of this. These are, uh, so this is one equation, this is like three equations. And they are known as the constraint equations, space like constraint equations. Now, it was shown by uh, Yvonne Shuke Buha and others sub subsequently that if you give me a metric G on sigma and a symmetric tensor K satisfying these equations. Indeed, you can solve forward the Einstein equations. Right? So this is really um, a well-defined initial value problem. Great. 
Now, let me talk a little bit about these equations. Uh, the, the first thing I want to point out to you that these equations, they relate uh, metric components. Components. Um, first, derivatives of the metric. Okay. Like, so I, I think of K as the first derivative of the metric. Um, so call it connection coefficients. And the uh, and, uh, coverage, coverage terms, okay? They're all connected by these equations. Can you add out this divergence? Is it like a down yeah. mu or is it like a triangle down mu? So or? Uh, the divergence G of K of I is, is defined to be uh, J also not K, work. J I. But it is not just the, the, the connection that comes from the metric. So there are some Christoffel symbols in there. Exactly, exactly. Um, so any other questions so far? So, okay, the takeaway from this is that, uh, so these constraints, the relation between this uh, up to second order objects of the metric. And another thing is that they, this, from a mathematical point of view, these are of elliptic nature, okay? These, are, these equations are of elliptic geometric nature. And the elliptic part, you can think of it as being responsible for some rigidity features. For example, every one of us has heard about the positive mass theorem, uh, which states that you know, uh, the only uh, one of uh, one of the consequences of the positive mass theorem is that uh, if the mass of such an initial data set is zero, you must be the trivial solution. You must be initial data for the trivial solution, which is Minkowski space map. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so that well, I think everybody knows Minkowski. Um, the geometric nature on the other, so that's why right, this is uh, rigidity. On the other hand, the geometric nature, nature of these equations um, allows me to, to have some underdeterminedness in the equation. So these equations, they, not, they do not fully, uh, fully determine all metric components of G, for example. But you can make a specific uh, gauge choices and actually prove uh, what they call gluing results. Okay. So you can, you can perturb solutions, you can glue different solutions together. And how, what, what do you mean by gluing? For example, um, you, you have one solution to the constraints here, and uh, you have yeah, and another solution here. But let's say you know they, they're, they're overlapping in a sense, and you you can glue them together along such a gluing region. Okay. In this sense, you can do, and we will see this a bit later. Okay. Great. That's all I wanted to say about the space-like initial value from initial value problem of uh, general relativity. So let's turn to the, to the characteristic initial value problem. Now, um, I want to make an approach which is almost similar to here, but instead of taking the space, uh, sorry, uh, space like hypersurface, which you can think of as constant time hypersurface, I want to take a uh, characteristic hypersurface. In other words, I want to put initial data on light cones. So I start out by taking a sphere here, yes. Uh, so it's a, a space like two sphere. And you know, you can shoot out here the outgoing light cone emanating from this sphere. And you can shoot in here the ingoing night home. Um, and I, I call this this outgoing one H and the ingoing one H bar. And you know, this ingoing night geodesics, I call them L bar, the outgoing one, I call them L. And now I'm telling you, I want to put initial data on such a hypersurface. Okay, I can make the same. Uh, the same approaches here. I can say, well, 
I can define, you know, um, I can generalize this idea of, uh, of uh, second fundamental form to this, instead of a T, I have now an L and L bar. So essentially you can say here is uh, L, L of G, T bar, you can think of L of T bar of G. And again, I could say from the Einstein equations and the fact that I have this hypersurface embedded here, I get some compatibility conditions between metric components, uh, connection coefficients, and curvature. And these constraint equations in this case, they are a bit more complicated to write out. I will not go into it here, but let's just call them uh, the null structure equations. Okay. Null structure equations. And there are two very important differences between this setup and that setup here. The first is that while these equations are elliptic, meaning that it's very hard to produce solutions to them. Actually, it's a very hard problem to come up with initial data sets for the three plus one formulation. Here, um, the nature of the equations is very different. They're of a transport equations type. Transport uh, equations. And what I mean by this is that, you know, you. Essentially, it looks like you have the L derivative um, of something is equal to um, something else, so on H, and uh, the L bar derivative of something is equal to other terms. So, these transport equations you could, you know, you can just integrate them along H and H bar. And the second point, so the first is that the, the fundamental nature is different. You can, you can integrate these equations easily. You can solve them in an easy, easy way. While this construction of the elliptic uh, solutions is uh, more difficult. Are the solutions they necessarily analytic like they are for the elliptic equations? Um, I mean, there, there are rough solutions to, the, to this I, equation. I mean, for the, for the transport thing, are the solutions necessarily analytic? So it's okay. That's a good point. So it depends. Um, it depends on. Okay. Let, let me make the second one and then we'll come back to it. Thank you. The thing here is that you can try to construct solution. Uh, it's a hard problem. However, the transport equations here they admit a hierarchy, a specific hierarchy, which allows to parameterize all solutions to these uh, transport equations. By a um, by a freely prescribable characteristic C. Okay. So um, so uh, what do you say? Um, you can freely prescribe a um, what I call characteristic C. Characteristic C. Which is going to be a limited set of quantities on the sphere here and h and h bar. And from that, by integrating the transport equations in a very in a, in a very explicit hierarchy, you can calculate all the metric components, connection coefficients, and curvature. Go ahead. Uh, so this is to rely a little bit on being able to evolve on all the generators, which is not going to happen if you have any focusing. So yes. You have generators leading the surface. Yes. So how how uh, how much of this Generalize to the case that you have generated the surface. So, I mean, so uh, it, it, you know, if you have here on that, okay, on that sphere here, part of that characteristic C is going to be to prescribe the, the expansion. Right now, yeah. I mean, yeah. like, and then locally, you know, I can, I can locally solve for a little while, and then on that, I put the initial data. But I'm not, you know, if I had a focus point, like you know, the, the nine hyperservice, they would yeah. like become more smooth. So I'm I'm not going through that. I just put um, data on regular cones that are not yet. Uh, um, so in other words, what I'm claiming is that you can parameterize all solutions to to the. Um, to the nice structure equations on such a cone through this freely prescribable characteristic. Okay. 
This is not the case for the elliptic equation. In general, you cannot parameterize solutions by something which you can freely prescribe. Okay. Um, you can, uh, we, will, we will discuss these characteristics in data. Now, what we discovered in our work is that this free prescription of the characteristic C allows you, yeah, you know, allows you to make specific growing constructions of characteristic initial. And what I'm thinking about, the picture you should have in mind for today is that um, if I give you characteristic initial data along this thing here, along a, an edge, an outgoing edge here, and I give you a different characteristic initial data up here. On, uh, on some H prime. What I want to do is, I want to extend this guy up to co to connect it here, and um, you know make a make a regular gluing between this red H and the green H prime, solving the the Nair structure equation. So this is the this would be uh, the characteristic gluing problem. Now the fact that I can freely prescribe uh, the characteristic seed in this region here is going to help me because it's you know, my degree of freedom for the problem. On the other hand, what we will see today is that- So can you uniquely define one glowing solution that can extend to each part? So, so for each characteristic C that you give me, I can, you, I can uniquely give you the solution to the non structure equations. But it turns out that there are obstructions to growing from here to here. Where, where do they come from? Well, I told you before that I have transport equations along that direction, along L. And it turns out that there are quantities where the right-hand side here is equal to zero. So they are precisely conserved along H up to here. And you know, in general, they're not gonna agree with what you have on, in the green H prime. So there are conservation laws that act as obstruction to bring these initial data sets nicely together. Would you say that there is not absolute freedom given that you can just imagine going and get a shot of the catering? So, I mean, for example, the, the characteristic C um, that you can prescribe here, you, know, you can think of it as prescribing he had, which you, know, you can think of as a, as a gravitational incoming radiation tool. But, even though you can fully prescribe this thing, you know, that you, you're not able to glue everything. So if you put in matter, I still don't think that uh, you can fully glue uh, everything. For example, if you, if you have Maxwell's equation, right, they, I mean, there, there are also conservation laws along. along. Yeah, but if you like it's an arbitrary matter, you could just spend anything you want it. But if you want to satisfy some equation of motion for the matter, you're saying that this would be so uh you know what is the gist of today's talk is that um we will study this growing problem um as a formalism to identify all conservation laws Along this outgoing non hypersurface. Okay? So if you if you say, well, I don't care about the growth problem, you know, it's mathematical, you can still say, you know, I'm interested in conservation laws, because at the end of the day, the things that are conserved out here, they're gonna come to a future non infinity where, where our observatories are sitting. Okay? And um, specifically for extremal and near extremal black holes, you know, uh, it's work in progress to show that. Um, and there's some American work already to show that um, this is going to be measurable for um, for the, the gravitational wave observatories. Okay. There's an observational signature that uh, we expect to see. Great. So, so in other words, you can easily think of today's talk as you know the growing problem or a classific a rigorous classification of all conservation laws. Okay. Like we we really find all the conservation. Um, so that would be the, the introductory part. Are there any questions so far about uh, the setup? Have you been saying anything about um, the question asked about the elasticity? Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. 
So in particular, so if you prescribe the characteristic seed to be, uh, you know, to be analytic, well, you, you integrate this transport equation and it's very explicit. Um, so the regularity is directly taken from the characteristic seed. So if you have non-analytic characteristic, uh, characteristic seed, you can get non-analytic. Yeah, yeah. In particular, in, you know, if you, for example, there's work of, uh, of Kahneman, uh, sorry, of Rodnianski and Luke, where they pick it very rough, they pick a, a huge jump in he had, and then the resulting uh, curvature commodity will actually be a, like a delta distribution. Any other? Great. So let's, uh, let's go, go back to, to the slides. Okay, sorry, let me just ask one Go ahead, okay. please, please. Um, Everything you've said so far, how reliant is it on having the zero cosmological constant? Just so far, I'm not yeah. sure what you're going to need it. Yeah. So, um, so if you have a cosmologically constant, you know, uh, these equations, uh, you know, you, you get some extra terms, and also here you get some extra terms. But the nature that this that you can think of this as elliptic equations and this in transport mm -hmm. equations, it is the same. So, in particular. Um, and I was discussing this with Maha. Um, I think that our formalism, it goes, you know, you can adapt it in a straightforward way for positive and negative quantity. Yeah, it's an interesting problem. How, how it's gonna change the character of the conservation loss, for example. So just on this point, which is I think fascinating because it's a really difficult point. Uh, the local picture, I think, doesn't change, but the global picture, in particular, what happens at infinity, what happens along the cosmological horizon, whether or not you can find a double null that extends as big as you can in some of the flat cases, is completely open. This is completely open. So, well, in any case, you don't have to have the initial data because of that. Yeah, but for positive lambda, it's also a mystery. In fact, we were discussing it yesterday in the hours of the night. So, um, great. So, um, let me let me um, you know mention some names before I continue. So, these gluing problems for space-like initial data uh, were studied heavily by the Riemannian geometry community. In particular, I want to mention the results of Colotto, Corino, and uh, Shane. And there, you know, let me. Recapitulate, we saw flexibility and rigidity features. For example, it is impossible to glue non trivial initial data to trivial initial data by the positive mass theorem because you know, there's this rigidity statement of the positive mass theorem. But on the other hand, any asymptotically flat initial data can be glued to a curved black hole. So, in, in a sense, the, the, in a sense, you can say that the conservation loss in this uh, space-like gluing direction is uh, 10 dimensional. And to glue to curve, you need to pick the right curve, which has the right the mass and the momentum the momentum center of mass. However, here in the characteristic gluing, we're gonna see an infinite dimensional space. Okay? So that's gonna make uh, that's gonna make our things a bit harder. Then I also want to mention the literature on hyperboloidal hypersurface. So they, they are space-like. You can put a short shot. Sorry? You can't put a short shot. So um, if, if, your, if your data, for example, uh, has non-zero linear, sorry, how does it work? Yeah, has non-zero angular momentum, you cannot do to Schwarzschild. Well, but you can put an angular momentum because it's very large distance, if you're going very large distance, if you could put that angular momentum with an arbitrarily small closed in energy. Um, so, so the thing is that um, in, in this space like viewing, you can adjust, you can glue everything except for this 10 dimensional space of, uh, of mass and, and so on. And you need to, to, pick, um, to, to pick your curve such that it matches what you have, whatever you get from your original space like initial data here. So in particular, 
but th there's no preferred 10 dimensional subspace of charges, right? There's, there's all the BMS charges. So if you're gluing procedure, I don't think there could be a invariant gluing procedure that would allow 10 of the charges because there are, there are no 10. Um, the, the, the energy and the momentum are in the ideal of the BMS group, but I, I can't think. So, so, okay, okay, so, 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 so you can't eliminate the mass. So, I, I guess you're allowing yourself to boost somehow to get rid of the momentum. Yeah. But it, it, whatever procedure it is, it allows you to get rid of the momentum. Okay. Um, should also allow you to certainly allow you to get rid of the angle of momentum. In the Covina shape so, proof, you, you, you have an obstruction which lies in this in the space and to, to kill the kernel, which you have to kill, you, you have to choose a number of things and that process ends up being, uh, ends up not being precisely, uh, you can't fix the angular momentum to be of any particular value. You need some wiggle room in the angular momentum to kill the kernel. Well, okay, so one suspects that there's something stronger than the Romanian shunt. You can get rid of the momentum, the linear momentum, by your going procedure. So it's kind of inconceivable that you can glue in a way that eliminates the linear momentum. But you can't eliminate, eliminate the angular moment. So you, so I'm saying, so this doing here. So in general, you know that uh, up to a finite dimensional space, you you can make them match. Okay, you can make a nice gluing. Yeah. Now the thing is, if if you take this uh, close to space like infinity, where your metric is close to to Minkowskian, yeah. there you can show that this space that you cannot glue uh, is exactly ten dimensional. And and what they do is they show that so that's not a that's not a BMS invariant state. There is no ten-dimensional space of conserved charges. Um, I just because Corino is shown didn't prove it doesn't mean it's not true. And, and indeed, Bob Wall once said to me that he thought that the Corino shown proof could be extended to. Also get rid of the but I mean, for example, in, in our work, right? So we show that the that there is a ten-dimensional space that is gauge invariant. So you you cannot. Uh, there is no gauge invariant ten-dimensional space of charges. Mm -hmm. Well, in our analysis, there comes one up. So, so I I don't know how to connect this to the BMS translations that you mentioned. Maybe we can discuss afterwards about this. But so the thing is, also in this Covino chain, um, the, you know, the, the range of, you know, there is a kernel of the adjoin, and they do determine that this kernel is ten dimensional. So, like you, I I'm I don't know how to connect this to intuition, but the BMS translations now. Sorry, sorry, intuition. Or as it should. Yeah. But your 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 knowledge and expertise about the BMS translation. Um, but so for from you know what, what I can say is for me personally, I can I can there's a 10-dimensional space here that I cannot glue by uh, by perturbing the metric here in, in any way. And the only way I can make this. I can make the at the end of the day a smooth solution is that if here I allow myself to, to pick a curve and I, I need to give myself the freedom of picking the mass linear momentum under the momentum center of mass. So in a sense, um, you know, I'm going to I'm I'm able to glue to a uh, curve black like hole where I need to be able to, to pick the, the mass and angular momentum parameter and the slice in which uh, in which you know I, I take this guy out from, and this slice is boosted, you know, to to make the, the linear momentum match and uh, translate to make the center of mass match. And so. 
But I will be very curious to, to talk with you later about this PMS translation to understand more. Uh, um, yeah, great. Any other questions so far? Now, uh, what, what we're going to talk today about is uh, you know the growing problem along characteristic carbon surfaces, which I drew out down before. And I want to mention that Aritakis he he studied this um, he studied such a characteristic growing problem for the homogeneous scalar wave equation, and um, he also saw that there are conservation laws for the homogeneous scalar wave equation along outgoing nile hypersurfaces um, in Minkowski and uh, along along uh, extremal current, extremal resonance and motion. And they led to what is now known as the Aritakis instability and uh, you know, the, the observational signatures. You can observe that future along future non infinity okay? Great. And um, so we hope that with our work, um, we can get more insight on the, on the full nonlinear um, analysis of these effects. Great. Now, um, just, just to give a, a short uh, statement about the gauge that we use, I, I want to, I want, you know, I said I have these large structure equations and they're very, you know, they're very, there's a heavy formalism to write it out. All I want to say is in this slide that um, we decide to work in double null coordinates. Uh, where I have these two functions, u and v, they're called optical functions, and they're such that the metric g uh, goes into this specific form. And essentially, you can think that um, I, I want the level sets of u to be um, outgoing null hypersurfaces and the level sets of v to be ingoing null hypersurfaces. This is the, the, the local gauge that I pick to work in. And then, you know, let me just Go, go quickly through the, the next slides because I don't think they're too important for this talk. You can make this ideal of you know, defining the metric components, connection of the first derivatives and the second derivatives. You can formalize it by introducing these uh, Greek symbols for the first derivatives and these Greek symbols for the uh, null curvature component. And then, as I said before, the null structure equations are the geometric relations between these, uh, these objects here. Okay? And just to show you how, um, how they really transport equations, I want to just flash this to you. And this D here is an L derivative. Okay, that's the only thing you should take away from this slide. I have L derivative is something, L derivative is something, L derivative, and so on. Here I have L bar derivatives along H bar. So these are really transport equations. Okay? This is just to, to give some more substance to this transport equation sentence over there. And you have the Nile Bianchi equations, and again, they are. You know, L and L bar derivatives only. So that's that's uh, great. Now let's talk a little bit more about um, about this characteristics um, because one detail will be related to the conservation law that we will see today together. Now, what? How can how can I freely prescribe this characteristic C? Well, on S, you're allowed to prescribe the induced metric. As well as the, NAR, the outgoing and the ingoing NAR expansions and the distortion vector eta. And on H and H bar, you're allowed to prescribe the conformal class of the induced degenerate metric. Okay, and this and the NAR labs omega as a scalar function. Is the characteristic C unique or are there across a class? So you are allowed to prescribe it. So, um, you know, you, you prescribe this conformal class. So it's a, a, it's a unique. Like it's an equivalence class of metric, right? but so it, it's yeah, it's a unique thing that you prescribe, and from that you get a unique solution, you know, a one to one correspondence to the solution of the full null structure equations. So, um, so from this characteristic seed, we can compute all metric components uh, along H and H bar by integrating this null transport equations that we saw on the previous slide. Okay, and then all these Greek symbols are perfectly well defined, and you can. Estimate the regularity by the regularity of the characteristic C. Great. Now, what I, what I want to take away from this slide is the following. First, um, um, it's going to be important for later that I prescribe the null expansion on the sphere S. Um, it's going to be transported by the Rajoduri equation. 
and I'm prescribing distortion vector eta, which will later be in this talk today, we will see a conservation of for eta. And on H and H bar, I can prescribe this conformal class of the metric and the scalar function, which will be important uh, for us in this region here. Okay? This will be our, our viewing, viewing tools, so to say. Now, let me define the, the characteristic gluing problem. So let's say you have two characteristic initial data sets, one on this null hypersurface emanating from S1, one from S2. Then um, what I said before is I want to connect these two uh, initial data sets by a null hypersurface carrying character, regular characteristic initial data. And as I mentioned before, the degrees of freedom are the prescription of the characteristic C along this red region here. So the conformal class and the scalar function. Um, and the difficulty is that there is information propagated from S1 up to S2. And uh, I need to be able to, to uh, understand if I can pick my degrees of freedom in a way to make it match. So in the sense of a control problem. Right? So can I pick this uh, degree of freedom such that actually all the transported things are matching up here? And if I have a conservation law, there's an obstacle to doing this. How does the dimension of S compared to H, right? This is one dimension. Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry. So S, S1 and S2, there are two spheres, space-like. And so these nine hypersurfaces, there are three manifolds, they're three dimensional. So I took out one dimension of this picture to, to draw it on the slide, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so this nine hypersurface is foliated, so this three manifold is foliated by two spheres. Huh? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm going through these two spheres as I go along L. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like the, the, the affine foliation of this outgoing black hole. Great, so um, I set up this, this thing. Now, this is actually not, not purely a, a well-defined problem on non-hypersurfaces. So let me, let me um, set it up in a slightly different way. Instead of considering all derivatives, I want to talk today about C2 gluing. So I want to glue at C2 regularity, which means on these spheres, S1 and S2 sitting in different space times, I just want to consider the metric components, the first derivatives and the second derivatives of the metric. And I want to ask myself, given such C2 data, um, does there exist characteristic initial data along this red non hypersurface such that on the boundary, I get exactly the metric components, first derivatives and second derivatives that you gave me in the first place. Mm -hmm. Now, um, having set up this characteristic green problem, the first thing you will tell me is that um, you cannot solve it in general, in general, okay? Because remember that we had this null second fundamental form. We had the, the null expansion and the celebrated Rachel Dury equation stipulates the trace key. Uh, it's derivative along the outgoing null hypersurface is actually non-negative, uh, sorry, non-positive. So trace key is non-increasing. So in particular, if we go back here and you were to give me here an expansion that is larger than down here, you know, I know that it's not gonna work. So I, I know that this characteristic green problem in general cannot be solved by the retro dual equation already. However, I came to there's a much more subtle thing going on, namely, even if we work close to Minkowski, where this monotonicity of the expansion is not a problem, um, there's an infinite dimensional space of conservation laws for the linearized null structure equations of Minkowski. So even this linearized problem, um, is, so it's having an infinite dimensional space of concentrations. Go okay, ahead, please. So very elementary question. Please. This gluing, should I think of it as kind of future directed or once you're glued it, will it work in both directions? Um, so, so you could, so, so the, the formalism we set up is to glue in the future direction. In the right? future direction. But um, you, you could also glue in the past. But it's a different solution. Or is it the same one solution which handles both? So, so if, if you were to glue from here to here, you say, from, 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 if you were to glue from H prime to down here to H, you mean? 
maybe I'm not even formulating it right. You've got an H, you're trying to match it to something yeah. as in dot exactly. Yeah. Right? yeah. So you've got a match yeah. by let us say doing your procedure, yeah. which is to me it seems for future Perfect. direct. Yeah, exactly. But having done that gluing, can you now use this for all time or is it only for kind of the future half? So um to, to have well defined characteristic initial data, I need I need the uh, and no, I need this part too. I didn't talk about it. But I, I didn't want to focus on that. Okay, no, and, I and then yeah. I can solve to the future. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. Um great. So what I want to do now is to to go into this linearized equations just to give you a, a short feeling of how these conservation laws pop up because of the structure of the equation okay so you know i have two nice structure equations here you know don't look at them too closely the only thing i want to mention is that if you combine the nice structure equations you get a nice transport equation for this eta here remember this eta was one thing that we that we prescribed uh that we prescribed down here right it was part of the characteristic C, eta and it was also part of that initial data set up here. So having a transport equation for eta from up here, from down here to up here, is potential trouble because we we um, we need to match it. Now, turns out that you know on the right hand side you have quadratic terms and you have these linear terms. So let's linearize this equation in Minkowski, and we get the following: the L derivative of this vector field is equal to the divergence on the round sphere of uh, this guy here, so the, the trace-free part of Q. Okay, so far so good. Now, why is this a nice equation? Why do I like this? If you take a symmetric trace-free two tensor on the round sphere and you calculate its divergence, that's gonna give you a vector field. But it's not just gonna give you any vector field. In fact, um, you know, it's uh, it's uh, well known that this guy here has no L is equal to one um, component. In other words, this vector field here is automatically orthogonal to the conformal killing phase of the round sphere. In other words, this vector field here is orthogonal to six dimensional space of vector fields on the round sphere. So let me directly take this equation and project it onto this L is equal to one vector sphere harmonics then the right-hand side turns to zero and the left-hand side, well, I get this component, this projected part of the vector field. And I get my first uh, precise exact conservation law for the linearized equations. Okay. So this, uh, this vector field, you know, it's, you can describe it by six numbers. It's gonna be conserved in the linear problem from down here to up here. So there's no chance you can glue it. There's no, there's no, no way you can you can glue it. Is that not just the angular momentum in this different formulation? Yeah, it's, so later we will, we, will, we will show that this is related to angular momentum and um, not the center of mass, right? because the center of mass is not conserved, but um, the, the equation of motion for the center of this. So a, a part of this conservation will be the conservation of uh, linear momentum. And a part of this equation will be the equation of motion for the center of mass. Great. Now, so, so th this was, you know, you might say, okay, this is just six numbers, but you, you promised us that there is an infinite dimensional space of obstructions. So let's, let's uh, talk about that. In fact, let me derive a second example of the conservation law. It turns out that, so the, the induced metric, you can split it up into conformal part into conformal factor times um, a part that has that has the standard uh, volume element. So you split it up in this. And from the ratchet dure equation, this turns into a second order equation for this conformal factor here. And the takeaway is that at the end of the day, we get a precise conservation law for this guy here. And this is a full scalar function. Okay. It's not just uh, you know, a finite dimensional projection of a function. This is really, you can think of it in, in all directions along each null generator, this quantity is conserved. Okay? So it's, really, it's a functional degree that's conserved along the outgoing null hypersurface. 
um, by the by the answer to the equation. And there are several more such conserved charges, um, you know, so which constitute like a finite number of functional degrees which are conserved. Yeah? And this is what I call infinite dimensional uh, spaces. Is this a generally covariant? It doesn't. If we have written, is there a generally covariant version of this? So the thing is, I, I'm going to show that this guy here is uh, is gauge dependent. So we'll be able to, to match it actually. So this, this will be on the next slide. So great great uh, question. Now, so we, yeah. if we just took this cone to be stry, is trace chi just the bond mass aspect? Um, so I would think of the, um, uh, so, so um, uh, trace key bar, I would think of the, the bond mass aspect in this case. Um, so we talked about the abstractions. And let's talk about how, how we can get rid of them. Um, so what I want to do is I want to I want to relax the problem. Okay, I, I said you know fix this S one in your space time one and the S two in your space time two. Try to glue them along an unhappy surface. That was too tough of a problem. I want to allow myself in the space time S two to perturb a little bit from S two to S two prime. This little perturbation, it's going to change the, you know, the, the metric components and the first derivatives and second derivatives here. And I'm trying to say, OK, can I at least glue from S1 to S2 prime? Okay. So this is a relaxed formulation. And how does this help us? Sorry. And also, I, I want to allow myself to, to change coordinates on that sphere S2 prime itself. Okay. Just, just make coordinate changes on this. Now, it turns out that these conservation laws and these charges that I had before, they split up into two groups under these linear sphere perturbations. Name me first one group of gauge dependent charges, which a proof can be fully adjusted by linear sphere perturbations and sphere deformities. Yeah. So, in a sense, I can get rid of them by, by making a gauge choice, the correct gauge choice in the, in the space time M2. On the other hand, there's a space of gauge invariant charges. Which are invariant under linearized sphere perturbations and sphere diffeomorphisms. So about these guys, I cannot do anything, and that's very bad news. However, uh, the good news, at least, is that we proved that the space of gauge invariant charges is precisely ten-dimensional, and we can relate this these uh, charges to the ABM integrals for energy linear momentum angular momentum center of mass. Okay, so so we have this um, this uh, this interpretation at least. Now, just to to show you quickly, um, so these are the explicit formulas for for this uh, ten-dimensional space. So this is really the um, the, LS equal, the, the LS equal to zero of rho, the L is equal to one of uh, this guy, and here of L and G, you can think of them as the L is equal to one node of eta. And as I said before, this is conservation of energy, linear momentum, angular momentum. And this guy here, you can think of it as uh, C minus TP. So it's the equation, so it's conservation is the equation of motion for the center of mass. Okay. So, so this, this kind of relation you can establish rigorously. Okay. Great. Now, um, let me state my main result to, to finish the talk. Um, consider sphere data x1 on this one and x2 on this two, close to respective sphere data on the round spheres of Minkowski of radius uh, one and two. Then, indeed, I can perturb this S2 to S2 prime, and I can construct a solution to the Nash structure equation from S1 to S2 prime that goes up to this 10 dimensional space of gauge invariant charges that I couldn't do anything about. Okay. So, in other words, um, we showed that for our C2 gluing, you know, the, we, we can glue up to this 10 dimensional space. Um, and I think uh, that's the, that's you, the time you, to... you can have an extra slide on the application if you want. Ah, OK. Or if you want, you can leave a bit more discussion. Uh, up to you. OK, so let me just mention, um, if, you, if you tried to glue higher regularity, you have higher order conservation laws. Uh, which is one of the things that we're looking into, how to classify and understand them. 
And then, um, so I'm not gonna go into the, into the full uh, thing, but let me just uh, make this connection to observational signatures. So we showed that obstructions to this characteristic room is precisely given by conservation loss for linear restoration. Conservation loss are the only obstruction to characteristic loan. Um, our theory presented above concerns small data close to Minkowski, but also it's known that these appear in the large data we see. For example, um, conservation loss along the event horizon of extremal back holes, um, which is, and we, we're studying this now for the for this characteristic loan problem for the answer equations. In that situation, as I mentioned before, uh, these charges cause the so-called horizon instability and can be computed by far away observers. So this was done uh, analytically by Artakis and numerically by Kana. Um, the charges can potentially serve as observational signatures and further connections of our growing theory and the theory of gravitational waves will be studied in the near future. Okay, okay let's... It, it's very common, at least in a, in a certain community, to, th uh, to think of kind of the, the metric as being kind of fundamental and it determines all other structure terms, the affine structure, the conformal structure, and, and so on. But th th this seems to be to be an interesting case where you have the affine structure kind of acting independently to impose constraints on how you can glue glue different metrics together. I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering. This is a very open-ended and broad question. Mm -hmm. how, how do you think about the relationship between the metric and the affine structure in these cases? It, it's the affine structure that, that determines the conservation laws. It's, it, it's, it kind of tells you what pieces of metrics you can glue together. It, 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 is, there, is there a coherent picture that I, I can use to think about how these different structures are relating to each other? Um, that's a good question. So, so the way I think about these conservation laws is that at the end of the day, you know, you are assuming that you work in a in a space time satisfying this Einstein vacuum equation. So the way, well, okay, first of all, the, the null hypersurfaces are very natural for Lorentz and Fermi folks to study. And I'm thinking of these conservation laws as rigidity features of the Einstein vacuum equations. Um, and you know, our analysis like shines a light on what is rigid for solutions of Einstein equations um, and what is what is uh, flexible for them in the sense that this is a geometric BDE and hence I would expect some geometric underdeterminedness to, to be there. And in a sense, this gluing um, studies what, what, what you, how, how far you can push this, uh, this to be there. That helps. Thank you. Maybe I want to make a comment uh, on um, some of the things we discussed before. Uh, so on Eric's point with regards to regularity earlier, there's really an exceptional theory um, showing us that regularity can be very bad in certain components and still maintain existence results. So it's really quite striking. You can have things that are even that are just measures, right? Uh, so that's one that's one comment. And then with the Corbino Shane stuff, um, so Andy, I, I would love to talk with you and, and just to, to hear what um, what's happening here. But let me just tell you my understanding of the Corbino Shane argument. Um, so you uh, produce an approximate solution by really uh, you know dumb interpolation, addition of metrics on either side, and a cutoff that just interpolates between the two, and then uh, you show that. Uh, you want to produce from this, uh, you know, candidate an actual solution to the constraint equations, and what you can show is that you can do that up to uh, a certain space, which lives in the kernel of some a joint operator, which is the, the an L two joint of the constraint map. So the constraint map will just take G and it'll take K and it'll give you, you know, the right hand sides of the equations. Um, there's an adjoint to that map. And then your obstruction to finding a solution lives in the kernel, which is finite dimensional of that constraint. Then when you want to actually glue something, you have to uh, use the, the wiggle room uh, to, there's a kind of degree argument where you use a wiggle room to be able to, to, to glue. And when you do that, you have to, you have to select a certain value 
uh, or you have to end up with a certain value of the angular momentum. But your question was, can you do the Schwarzschild? And what I think there is an answer to your question, which is that if you go into the details of the Corvina chain argument and you don't just say, I have some arbitrary solution that I want to glue, for which the only way to do that is to glue the curve, so long as the proof goes. But I've encountered situations where myself, I wanted to glue the Schwarzschild. And I think that if you had more information about the solution that you started with, then the degree argument I just mentioned, where you kill this you know, kernel by selecting some angular momentum, selecting some mass parameter that you glue to, uh, I think that can be probably uh, you know, taken away. And I think you can just probably glue the short shell, but you would, you would I, the, only see I, the only way I see, of do, I see of a way of doing that is to have more information to begin with with the solution that you have. Uh, that doesn't answer, and that doesn't get to the main thing of what you were saying, but just on the proof of, you know, Corbin or Shane, that, that's how I see it. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, thank you for this. Inside of this issue. Can I just, I mean, you had a slide basically where you were trying to make the later sphere wiggle, right, mm -hmm, in order mm -hmm. to be able to match. And that looks like exactly doing a super translation later on, right? So super translation just transports mm -hmm. the sphere up mm -hmm. at different amounts at each angle. And if you took that cone to be scribe, then the amount that that happens is related to the radiation that passes through, right? So I think you're basically just, so here you're like in the middle of the space time and you're allowing yourself to do a diffeomorphism which sort of straightens out that sphere. Mm -hmm. But as a scry, you've frozen in the frame. And those diffeomorphisms that you would do actually have physical content because it's really this the super translation okay. that yeah. induced yeah. by radiation passing through. And I think that's supposed to so that it sounds like you're basically doing super translation on some bulk cone in the middle and eliminating those constraints, but I don't think you're supposed to be eliminating them if it's actually at the asymptotic. Uh, so, so, so what, uh, what we're currently working on is to exactly to go in this direction, to bring this characteristic going to future and infinity and try to understand. Um, so for example, try to, try to understand, try to see the NP count, the Newman Penrose constants, uh, in this framework to, to pop up. And um, so we, we're doing this right now, but yeah, it's, you know, as far as, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, at the moment we're, we're thinking about, you know, how to distinguish quantities that I want to think of as, um, as correct quantities to glue up here and quantities that I, I don't want to consider. So, uh, so we haven't, uh, or I haven't uh, fully worked this out yet. But, uh, it, it, I, yeah, it, it will be related to BMS translations and uh, this, uh, this type of things. But isn't everything you're doing here is you're strictly regarding two things which differ by diffeomorphism? Is equivalent, even if it's a super translation, right? You're, you're just not addressing that issue. Sorry, could you repeat it? You're strictly regarding any two space times which differ by a different morphism as equivalent, right? Are you? You're not. Um, so space times which are different morphic, I think of them as the same. Yeah. Um, I think that's part of why you don't have a momentum, right? You're, you you would regard short shield and boosted short shield as the same, even though one so has momentum. I, I think of its sphere data as being different. At the end of the day, to, to apply these PD methods, um, the, the actual value of the metric component in the specific gauge that I chose is going to be different. And I'm using this fact uh, to, to adjust, uh, for example, the, uh, the gauge dependent charges. So sphere data, I think of it as being gauge dependent. 
for example, if you if I if I if I change only the coordinates on my sphere, like this guy here is going to change, um, which is an essential ingredient of the sphere data. Any other questions from our speaker? Steph. All right. Well, let's thank you again.